Day chaps, so today's video will be on one of the more mysterious tanks in the British collection, the A33. This tank, despite having a surviving prototype, Gathering Dust, has far more questions than answers. In fact, we don't even know its true name. That said, its background is interesting and sheds new light on its classification and that of other British tanks. So we'll begin with the tank classification system the British used. This is often unfairly dumbed down to infantry and cruiser tanks, which was anything but the case. In point of fact, the British had quite a wide variety of vehicle classifications. Research in the archives has shown that there were in fact four main groups, not three. These are broadly split into four areas. There were light tanks, cruiser tanks, infantry tanks, and assault tanks. And it's these two we will look at more closely, as they are far more relevant to this video. So the infantry tanks. These were again split into two categories. There was originally a light infantry tank from the 1920s, but this was dropped. The later classifications had infantry tanks and heavy infantry tanks. The intended role for the infantry tank, as the name suggests, was to support the infantry, have heavy armour, engage fixtures in enemy tanks. Examples of these are the Matilda and the Valentines, but also the Churchill, and this last one will be of significant importance. Then we have assault tanks. These two also had two classes, assault tank and heavy assault tank, and evolved from the shelled area assault tank concept, which came about pre-war as a fear that the situation would devolve into a war of attrition, with the Germans building the Siegfried line and the French their Marginaux line. These tanks were originally designed to cross thick mud, trenches, wire, and remove obstacles like dragon's teeth, while having heavy armour. However, this scenario never came to pass. Examples of assault tanks include the A33, the A38 Valiant, and the A39 Tortoise. Throughout the war years, the names, roles and purposes of these vehicles would switch back and forth. Churchill would occasionally be referred to as an assault tank, and A33 would occasionally be recorded as an infantry tank, and there were also hybrids of the role submitted. From the documented evidence, there appears to be a strong disconnect between the doctrine written and what was taking place in the field, which together bore little resemblance to some of the designs submitted and considered by the tank board. One should also note that members sitting on these board meetings also included the industrial heads or leads of the firms manufacturing these tanks, and so it would not be unfair to say that they had a vested financial interest in the creation of new vehicles and concepts. So how and why did A33 end up getting called an assault tank? To understand where this name comes from, we have to look back at Churchill. This tank was an evolution of the A20 series made by Harland and Wolfe in Belfast, and when first designed, it was built for the role of an assault tank, not an infantry tank. Specifically, she was a shelled area assault tank. This design required a heavy vehicle with a selection of guns and a design to overcome the types of obstacles which it might face, notably trenches and tank traps. The original idea was very similar to the tank seen in World War I, with sponsons incorporating two-pounders or machine guns and a forward-facing howitzer for demolishing structures. Later, a turret was added from the A-12 Matilda and the side sponsons dropped, although there were still insets for machine guns. And yet somewhere along the line, she is rebranded as Infantry Tank Mark IV, although her role is still firmly listed as that as an assault tank. So how did this early Churchill tie in with the A-33? The more fundamental problem Churchill had was in its very rushed development and production. Like the Covenanter and the Crusader, the Churchill was rushed off the drawing board and thrown into a role it was not meant for. This led to a lot of problems, particularly around the suspension, which was designed to operate for only very short distances, as well as the requirement for high ground clearance but a long length for lower ground pressure which left it with an odd centre of gravity as well as gun depression issues and a high profile. This led to some serious concerns at the War Office. But what to do? It was thus proposed on the 5th of May 1942 
to replace Churchill with a new assault tank, and that the previous tank, the Churchill shelled area assault tank, would be scrapped once the current order had been completed. This report, RTB number 41, listed the problems with Churchill, in that being designed as an assault tank, it was not an effective infantry tank, and that its problems lay first in not having been adequately tested, and secondly, trying to fulfil a role it was not designed for. Thus we get the requirement for a new assault tank issued, and this is why the A33 is an assault tank and not an infantry tank. The same paper goes on to recommend reworking the Cromwell 3, and that the engine and transmission remain the same, as these take the longest to develop and the rest can be modified. The new specifications called for a tank with not less than 100mm of arm on the front, and if possible, well armoured elsewhere. A 6 pounder gun in the turret, wide tracks and armoured side skirts, to protect the suspension and to have a mobility greater than that of the Churchill. This led to several proposals. Rolls-Royce produced A31 and A32 drawings, sometimes marked as the infantry Cromwell, a sort of oxymoron almost. These two were concept designs for assault Cromwells and would be drawn up to evaluate how much armour would be added, about 5 tonnes, and to see if the new wheels, tracks and suspension would be required. It is marked that they are lighter at 31 and 32 tonnes. In meetings discussing the A31, they state they felt it would be better at 3.5 inches or 88 millimetres of armour, which is not a huge improvement over the regular Cromwell, while the extra armour would go on the back for 40 millimetres. They also discussed removing the side skirts and auxiliary machine guns, which would have rendered the whole project rather pointless. These tanks would use the Cromwell turret with the Churchill mantlet. Either way, these two are then rebranded Cromwell assault tanks, and the later one, A33, would be dubbed Cromwell Heavy Assault Tank. Now as you might have noted, I have stuck with using the A number and not an actual name. And this is because to date, the actual name has not been found. The title Excelsior is not once recorded in the minutes anywhere where A33 is discussed. It may well have been a name given by English Electric, but so far nothing has been found. One name that does crop up however is Commodore. This might well have been a name and appears in some liaison reports. However, the same name is also applied to the A30 Stage 2, the A40 tank, which is also recorded as Commodore. And so while it can't be said for sure, the name is at least recorded in some contexts. But until more evidence can be found, it will simply be referred to as A33. So back to the tank's development. A requirement was placed for two prototypes to be built by English Electric. Meanwhile, the Americans pitched in and the American Locomotive Company produced the T-14 assault tank, also to the same requirement, with two built. However, there were also others. One is the A-38 Valiant, based on the Vanguard hull. This too had a six-pounder gun, required armour, but did lack the mobility aspect. This tank is also brought up in the same minutes as A-33, and when one was buffed, so was the other and so we can at least conclusively say that Valiant was a mirror project to the A33 and was likewise dubbed Heavy Assault Tank. The later Tortoises were also Heavy Assault Tanks, but would run parallel as non-competing projects and would eventually evolve into their own thing. I'll cover T14 in a different video someday, and for now we'll just stick with the A33. As we said, this vehicle was to have two pilot models, Initially, both were to be fitted with the American-style T1 suspension, taken from their M6 heavy tank. However, this was followed quickly by the inclusion of a second set, dubbed the RL suspension. A33 would turn out to share remarkably little with the Cromwell. In RTB minutes 46, they explained that due to the thicker turret face, the hull would need to be longer, to prevent the driver's hatches being caught and the requirement for the side plates would require a new hull to be rebuilt entirely. But as these are static items, they felt they wouldn't be too problematic. Many other changes were also readily apparent. The back decks, for example, differ between the vehicles, and the layout of crew access and so on. Of these, the first vehicle ready was the Americanized version, with 4.5 inches of armour and a weight of 40 tonnes, 
in September 1943 and was sent to undergo evaluation trials. The vehicle was running at Chertsey and did quite well for itself compared to others. However, it was felt that the suspension itself was weak and that it was not designed for more than 40 tonnes at a fixed speed and distance. This is rather odd as the M6 tank was heavier, so it might be more in relation to operational range or constant speed or perhaps the mountings. Either way, the suspension idea was dropped. The trials highlighted a few issues. Track pins coming loose, engine issues and other, other washers coming loose. All the stuff regularly associated with any new tank prototype in its first tests. However, over the 1,000 mile test drive, no serious defects were found. One issue was that it picked up a lot of mud, some two tons of it. But the report clearly states that this did not cause any problems to the tank. A second note states that while at Chertsey, it was also fitted with a six pounder gun and not the later 75mm gun fitted. The fate of this vehicle is uncertain. However, as a later report states that an A33 was used up as firing trials, it would not be too much of a stretch of the imagination to consider it was this one. A second vehicle with the RL suspension was ready in November of 1943. This one was heavier than her sister at 45 tonnes and was fitted with a 75mm gun as during the time spent it was decided that 75mm guns would be needed in future, which rolled out across several vehicles, including the Valiant. Her back plate and engines also differ from the earlier version, with a large square pagoda cover over her back deck. The suspension, which was not Christie type as recorded, was based on a design LMS had been working on, and consisted of six road wheels in a 1-2-2-1 layout and unlike the first pilot model, were near fully enclosed by heavy side skirts. The top track rides much higher than the pilot model and are nearly rhomboidal in shape. Like her sister, she also retained the large escape hatches on the side. These were connected to the inner hull by a steel tube which would allow the crew an easier job of bailing out of the vehicle if needed. The A33 retained the meteor engine and transmission from the Cromwell but was still able to hit 24 miles an hour, a considerable improvement over that of the Churchill. Like the first vehicle, she did not have a bow machine gun fitted, but this was due to it not being required at the trial stage, not because it couldn't fit one. The design itself is otherwise fairly standard. You have a five-man crew, commander, gunner, loader, driver and bow gunner. The turret is somewhat to the centre and the engine to the rear. The protection is very good, being 114mm on the upper front, middle and lower plates. The sides are also very thick due to the skirts and an inner hull reaching up to 5 inches in places, and the rear was 3 inches thick. All in all, the A33 was very well armoured for its time, more so than the Tiger tank. While all this design work was going on, the previous issues with Churchill had been resolved. Early on, the howitzer was removed and the reliability had been drastically improved, and she was proving to be quite a dependable little tank. A new heavier church was soon ordered with 6 inches of armour and a 75mm gun, with a request for 200 placed. Seeing this natural growth, it was felt that the A33 should also have at least the same level of protection and firepower, and so a third prototype was to be made with 6 inches of armour over the front, a 28% increase. This would lower the top speed, however, down to 13 miles per hour. To counter this, it was to have a lighter version of the RL suspension, but no specifics were given. It was hoped this third hull would be ready in December 1943, with the trials beginning in February 44 and production in early 45. This third hull would now feature a new high-velocity 75mm gun, the same gun that would eventually become the Comet 77, and a wider turret ring of 64 inches. A report issued from the DTD also indicated that the turret from the A34 Comet would be fitted to this hull. How much of Prototype 3 was completed is not recorded, but it was later cancelled in 1944 and the lighter suspension was to be fitted to the second hull for testing purposes, although it's not recorded this was done or not. So on to the fate of the A33. This too, like much of the tank, has been clouded over the years. 
The answer when asked is usually that by late 44 or 45, the church had redeemed itself and was proving more or less satisfactory, and so the A33 was no longer needed. But this is sadly not actually the case. Work on the A33 had carried on, even when Churchill was doing a lot better, and in the minutes when they're ordering new heavy Churchills, it states that A33 will continue. Had this been the case, as previously mentioned, it would have stopped there. The simpler truth is that the time of the war was coming to an end, that a tank armed with a 75mm gun and 4 inches of armour was simply no longer required. The same fate would be applied to the Churchill. Two more vehicles would emerge from the A33, and the first was the A37, often stupidly called Super Excelsior. This was a proposed enhancement over the regular A33 to weigh 45 tonnes with an all-round traverse and a 17-pounder gun fitted. Oddly enough, this one is now listed as an infantry tank and not an assault tank. It was recorded that to have the armour required notably 152mm to the front and 95 to the sides, as well as a large tote for the 17-pounder, it would not be possible to have it at 45 tonnes, and so she was recalculated at 52 tonnes, with a top speed of 18 miles an hour. To achieve this, the A37 had an extra set of wheels and a longer hull. This tank, although given the go-ahead, only ever reached the drawing stage, none of which have yet been found how it is most likely the modified form of the A30 turret. The final version was for arrival to Centurion and was submitted in May 1944. This vehicle was based on the A33 but differed in several aspects. It retained the same road wheels, recorded as 6 18-inch wheels and 7-inch return rollers, a 69-inch turret ring with a 17-pounder gun. This would have two coaxial .303 Vickers machine guns and a single Beezer machine gun in the rear turret like the Centurion. The hull was still stepped and not sloped like Centurion and had no bow machine gun port. The ground pressure was marginally better at 11 pounds compared to Centurion's 12 and it was recorded as performance wise to be equal to Centurion and at 42 tonnes appears to have lighter armour than the original A33. No drawings have yet been found so this is just a guesstimation artwork based on the project at the time. The design proposal was submitted to the Director of the Royal Armoured Corps. However, as Centurion was nearly ready and had all the desirable traits, the last A33 concept was politely declined, despite being marked outstanding. A33 didn't leave any lasting legacy on tank design, save perhaps like others it has been unfairly criticised by those who should know better. For its time it was very good. Its trials went well, bar a few minor expected issues and it offered comparatively better all-round features than many of the vehicles at its time. It's reasonable to assume that its main drawback was that unlike its precursor, it was actually widely evaluated, and each aspect assessed before any production order was placed. Today, only one vehicle is left, in a dusty state at the VCC at Bobbington, where it sports a quite atrocious paint job. Well guys, if you did like this video and you want to know more, do ask below. Um, we'll cover T14 in its own little video in the future because obviously that ties in with this vehicle as well as some of the other quirky British tank designs that were coming up around the same time as A33. If you did like it, do hit that subscribe button, that like button and all the other gubbins on the top there. And until next time, toodle pip.